And good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, TDS webinar. So typically, Namir uh, Amzo is hosting our webinars. Unfortunately, he is not available today due to sickness, so we wish him well. Um, so I will, I will um, introduce the speaker today and introduce the webinar and also host the Q&A uh, session at the end. So I'm Daniel Maroder. I'm a structural engineer and technical director at PTL in Christchurch, and I'm also the current president of the Timber Design Society. And it's always great to be part of these webinars have had great success over the last um, two years. So today's webinar um, is with John Rebook. And before I hand over to him, I, I wanna quickly acknowledge our TDS sponsors who are supporting us in the background to make events like this and others happen. So we have uh, Future Build, MyTech, Simpson Strong Tie, and Rotoblast, and we recently also have iBuild who joined us as the sponsors. So big thank you to them. I have a few other news because the last half of this year seems to be shaping up as um, a great event in terms of timber knowledge and acquiring new information on it. So we are very pleased to announce that we have partnered up with Roto School or Roto Blast. Uh, so Roto School on Tour has now a New Zealand edition, um, which will be held in October and to be precise, there's an event on the 24th of October in Auckland on the 26th of uh, October in Wellington and on, on the 30th of October in Christchurch. It will be a whole day event with some uh, theoretical sessions, but then also a hands-on session where participants are required to assemble some of their timber uh, structures with the Rotoblast products. So um, I've done one back in Italy when I was uh, more for junior engineer and I found it quite exciting and also good learning of how everything comes together. So TDS is supporting this event. And if you're a TDS member, you will receive an email in the next few days with a promo code and you get a discount if you attend one of the sessions, which I highly recommend. Um, another event coming up, as you probably know, is the, uh, the Timber Design Awards, which are to be held on the 2nd of November in Auckland. And because many of you hopefully will be in Auckland for the day anyway, uh, Timber Design Society, together with Timber Unlimited, uh, which is what's formerly being known as Timber Design Center, we will be organizing a hybrid timber building seminar. So we cover the trends uh, in New Zealand, in Australia, around the world about hybrid timber structures. So essentially designing structures with different timber materials, but also in combination with steel and concrete, because we always need to remember right material in the right place. So we will cover, cover that and it will cover anything from consenting to client perspective to design um, and also how it comes together. So um, shortly there will be some announcement on this phase and you can also start booking your tickets, but for now, save the date, obviously. Right, so to today's uh, presentation, um, as I said, it's gonna be presented by John Rebook from Holmes. So um, John Rebook is an engineer at Holmes Solution and he's leading the mass timber technology team to deliver research and development programs from the laboratory here in Christchurch. And if you haven't been to the laboratories, I recommend you try to get in touch with John and he might give you a tour. Uh, we have also organized, uh, organized specific days and, and visit the lab and we will definitely try to do that again in the near future, uh, hopefully with more timber testing uh, being underway. So in today's webinar, John will introduce some example of technology that Home Solutions have already developed and shared uh, some future trends and opportunities from around the world, which can enable mass timber to achieve much wider adoption here in New Zealand. So it's really great to see this global expertise being I use the term translated. It's not just because it might be written in a different language, but it also in a different context. New Zealand is high seismic and has also some quite pe uh, peculiar um, uh, things around the, the type of timber we use and also treatment and other aspects, which also need to be translated into the New Zealand context. And John and his team have worked a lot on this and are really enabling some of this technology to be then used on a commercial basis in New Zealand as well. So I'm really excited to listen to John's talk today. And with this, I pass over to you, John, and thank you very much. Thanks, Daniel. Um, wow, that's quite a billing. Hope, hope I can live up to it. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, it's great to be able to um, 
present at the event today and particularly I just want to acknowledge all the work that Daniel and the TDS team are doing in advocating for timber design here in New Zealand um, and it's nice to have the opportunity to be able to give something back into that process. Um, so this, this webinar that I'll present today, it's quite uh, wide ranging. Um, uh, I'll touch on a few of these trends and opportunities that we've seen from overseas. Um, and yeah, as Daniel said, what that might mean for us in a New Zealand context going forward. So I will, I'll give a, a brief introduction to um, myself and Home Solutions and what we do. Uh, I'll talk about some of the mass timber technology that we've been involved in developing and then some thoughts on where we think the industry could be heading next from here. So who we are, uh, so myself, John Roebuck, um, I am the team leader of the mass timber technology group at Home Solutions, but I think I've probably arrived uh, in this subject area by a bit of a roundabout route compared to most people on this call. So the, the majority of the early part of my career, I actually spent in the automotive industry. So uh, that's, that's a few of the projects I worked on during the, the 1990s and early 2000s. Um, I, I moved to New Zealand uh, about 15 years ago and transferred across to marine engineering so working on water jets and, and mooring systems but still very much in that kind of mechanical engineering high volume production kind of uh, field so it was a bit of a left turn for me to to join home solutions four and a half years ago and um, end up working in a very different field but i think so I, I, I make no claim at all to be a, an expert in structural engineering myself, but I am certainly surrounded by my colleagues who are, and they keep me uh, on the straight and narrow. Um, but I guess what I do bring is a bit of awareness of that kind of high, high volume manufacturing environment and how, um, how you can approach systems engineering to be efficient for construction and manufacture and so on. So I'm sure you're all familiar with the, the Homes Group. Um, clearly, we, we have a strong presence here in New Zealand, but we're also operating in North America, Australia, and in Europe as well. Um, the Homes Solutions part of that group, we sit alongside our structural and fire engineering colleagues um, in, the, in the various regions. But our focus is a little bit different. Uh, we specialize more in research and development, um, innovation of technologies rather than designing uh, specific buildings or, or other um, systems. So we have uh, a lab here in Christchurch. Um, that's about half of it. Uh, and the, the team that deliver that, there's about 65 of us who work here in Hornby, and then we're about another 15 of us scattered around the world in, in different locations. Um, as of right now, we are New Zealand's largest commercial testing lab. Uh, and the kinds of things that we get into um, are pretty wide ranging. Um, a lot of the stuff that you'll see in this presentation is around development of technology for mass timber, um, but we do other things we have. Um, so we have our own fire furnace where we do a lot of testing. We develop um, systems and kits of parts for, for clients. And sometimes those are related to um, projects from our sister companies. Uh, but sometimes we're actually working directly with collaboration partners. And in some cases that will be hardware suppliers or developers and so on. But building um, systems are not the only thing we do. We also develop uh, crash barriers. So we have our own crash testing facility out at the Ruapuna race circuit here in, in Christchurch. And we crash on average uh, about 80 Dodge Rams a year, something like that. Um, I think we are still the largest importer of Dodges to New Zealand. Um, because they happen to be the standard test um, vehicle for those kinds of crash barriers. Uh, we also, um, we develop adventure recreation rides like zip rides with some unique technology in there that allows them to go around corners, that sort of thing. 
and we're developing that technology into uh, urban transport systems, um, which are, a, you know, a potentially a big growth area for our business going forward. So it's a pretty diverse um, engineering business that we have, and that leads to quite a, a flow across of different ideas from one sector to another. So uh, we've been on this journey with mass timber technology for about four years now. Um, it was it was an area that we decided to target. Um, we could see it was um, it was an area of the industry that seemed quite incomplete in terms of the products that were available, um, and it kind of it aligned with our our values as a company. We like operating in areas that. Um, make a meaningful difference that are going to contribute to more sustainable solutions and more affordable solutions and, and that sort of thing. So we made a very deliberate um, move into this area. And, and we could see that there's this sort of roadmap for uh, adoption of mass timber buildings, starting off with um, the innovative and the prototype kind of buildings, then moving through the, the early adopters who have incentives to move to mass timber. Then there will be a, mar a, a more widespread market uh, acceptance um, where the efficiency and the cost competitiveness and the approvals are more straightforward, um, which is what unlocks a wider spread adoption on a scale where we can actually start conceiving of timber, whole timber communities, whole timber cities. And that sounds quite far-fetched, but if we're actually gonna live up to a lot of the claims that we're making about a meaningful difference, that's actually where we need to be. Um, we need to be on a scale of thousands of buildings before we can start to live up to those promises. Um, where, where do I see we are now? Well, I think in all honesty, we're probably still somewhere in this early adopter phase. Um, so I think the Merit building here, that was that was completed in 2014, so nine years ago. We're probably still at a stage where I think everybody in this call could name the, the most most of the timber buildings that have been built over the last decade in New Zealand, which means it's still a pretty small number in uh, in real terms. And, and we need to shift the dial. We need to get to a point where we have this market acceptance of mass timber as a solution. Um, and there are challenges. We're currently struggling to be competitive on efficiency, on approvals and on cost. Um, and from our perspective, the key to unlocking that is developing and promoting the right technologies. So more, more specifically, what do we see that means? So the key um, characteristics of these technologies, we think boils down to four main categories. They have to be rapid and repeatable. They need to be reusable, and that's that's kind of moving the conversation on a little bit from just they need to sequester carbon to a bit more of a meaningful definition of, of circularity. And I think also there are aspects of resilience and robustness that are also going to be key to achieving this um, widespread market acceptance. So we'll dig into each one of those areas and um, show you a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of um, what's happening, uh, particularly overseas. So for, for rapid and repeatable solutions, offsite prefabrication clearly is a, a large component of that. Um, and that can take different forms. Um, we can have prefabricated elements that are brought together on site or complete panelized solutions or volumetric solutions. And um, we've seen it done in different ways on many different projects with different outcomes. Um, we've certainly seen um, that you can get good outcomes from these. Volumetric, I think, is there's still some question marks around which building types that suits and whether the, the transport and the logistic aspects of that make sense for every type of building. But um, 
I think you can also, we can end up being a little, uh, we, the delineations between these types are not necessarily that um, clear. So here's an example of a building that we worked on. This is not a timber building, but it's a pretty interesting example of something that's somewhere between all those. So this is the exchange tower in Detroit. The, the structural engineers on this were um, uh, Thorns and Tomasetti. Uh, and we worked with them to develop the, the corbels that hold each of these floors that are, are lifted up into position. So it's effectively, it's prefabricated at ground level and lifted up floor by floor. And uh, we developed this um, slip critical connection and then a, a system to test it here at the lab in Christchurch. And then um, this is a video, let's hope it plays of the floors being lifted into position um, and that building is now complete and uh, I believe as of now open for business. Um, so uh, a little bit of a, a, a sideshow for a talk about timber but just a, an interesting illustration that prefabrication is not just uh, it's not just boxes or panels. Um, so prefabricated elements uh, clearly in isolation, they work great. The key challenge is how do they work together and how do you integrate them in a way that the interfaces and the connections work as a complete building system? And the, the terminology that we use around that is a kit of parts. You develop a pre-solved kit of parts so that you're not resolving all of those type thing, things each time you come to build on site. Um, so a kit of parts approach, um, it works well for um, high volume developers who are doing the same thing over and over again. And I think that um, that's where a lot of the innovation is gonna happen in this space is the types of developers who have kind of relatively regular repeatable buildings um, where it's worth investing in getting in this kit of parts right to, um, to enable future developments. Um, and a key, a key thing that we see, interestingly, uh, it, it's a different attitude in different regions is the, the, the ability to de-skill the work on site um, by making it as easy to assemble as possible. Now, in the, the interesting thing is when we talk to people in US about this, that's a real key driver because the, the unionized workforce there um, potentially doesn't have the same skill base that it does in certain other regions. Um, so that's definitely a key enabler for efficiency on site. When you have those same discussions in Europe, particularly maybe the German speaking countries, uh, it's a bit of a different attitude because there is still a, a tradition of kind of carpentry and craftsmanship amongst the timber construction companies. And that means potentially right now they still have a they, they, they still have an appetite for more kind of precise, skillful solutions, um, which doesn't necessarily translate well uh, worldwide. And I think that's definitely something, um, something to note because a lot of the technology that's available for mass timber now has come from those no Northern European countries and it's developed in a construction environment that's maybe a little different to the ones that we operate in here. Um, yeah, food for thought. So an example of where we're seeing kit of parts done well, to some extent, is um, the, the range of Heinz T3 buildings in North America uh, and now Australia. So if you're not familiar with it, it's around uh, about seven buildings which are these large commercial office buildings that all have a very similar uh, configuration. Um, they're not identical. So they have kind of micro standardization, but at, at a macro level, they're still kind of customizable to the particular site and, and requirements of that region. But there's definitely a very recognizable elements through all of them, um, in particular things like uh, these um, connections around the beamed column are a, a common design that to some extent is pre-approved and pre-qualified and takes a lot of the 
um, risk out of the design and construction process each time. So that's definitely, um, that's a, a real world example of something that's um, a pretty close to a full kit of parts approach. Um, where we've got involved has, has ranged across a few different um, um, types of building. So commercial developments, uh, those kind of large uh, office buildings, but also residential apartments. Uh, and interestingly, we're also getting involved with um, timber data centers as well. Um, can't really talk about that too much yet. Um, <clears throat> one of the projects that we're probably most um, well known for is working with Lendlease. Uh, so we, we got engaged with them after Lendlease had completed around five mass timber buildings in Australia, um, including like on the, oh, the, in these pictures here, that's the uh, International House in Sydney, um, which are spectacular buildings. They are, they're quite stunning. Um, and um, they, they have a kind of a, a I think Lendlease had mixed feelings about them. They're, they're very successful in terms of their uh, final execution, but the efficiency in achieving them wasn't uh, as high as they'd hoped from a cost and a timing perspective. And they invited us to get involved in this program for their next round of uh, a kind of worldwide timber building system to try and understand that and figure out where they needed to develop technology to, to resolve some of those issues. Um, so we we got involved with this, and and because they uh, they had opportunities across a, a number of markets in Europe, in US, as well as Australia and New Zealand, um, that gave us an interesting challenge to design solutions that would work uh, across regions. So that meant doing a kind of a a survey across all the different codes, our uh, present and future trends, to try and um, come up with a single kind of global solution for them. So the kit of parts that we were developing, it's a, it's a system where um, you effectively have a, a pre-solved catalog of parts where you, you know how all those things are going to interface together from a structural, from a fire, an acoustic, a moisture control, uh, and an approval point of view, and really simplifying down the, the design and the, the construction process. But the key in a designing a, a kit of parts like that is to really understand what the requirements are, um, which means engaging with all the people that are going to be involved with this uh, to, do, to understand what their requirements are. Like the, the, the key thing is not to start with what you think the clever solutions are, it's start out finding out what the requirements are of the people that are going to be using them. Um, and that means everyone who is effectively a stakeholder in this. So the designers, the approval bodies, the, the general contractors, the, um, the manufacturers, ev everyone who has uh, an interest in um, the system that you're creating. Uh, and a big part of what we did was to go out and undertake face-to-face -face research. So not just kind of um, Googling for the published data, but going out and talking to people where you find out real opinions and real experiences um, that might not be shared so readily in, uh, in public domain. And then to make sense of all this data that we gathered, we developed these metrics so that we could evaluate the, the data and the experiences that we were learning and, and start to see how these different systems were working against the, the, require, the key customer requirements. Um, for the particular, um, systems we were looking at with Lendlease that boiled down into requirements around minimizing hook time on the crane, um, achieving better floor to ceiling height, uh, being uh, meeting the robustness requirements of Eurocode, uh, achieving the North American fire ratings, and um, having a resilient, a post-seismic resilient structure. And those five kind of requirements are actually pretty challenging to achieve simultaneously for a, uh, for a building structure. So for, um, 
for this rapid and repeatable sort of characteristic, the key is about how you integrate the systems, um, how you resolve these interfaces. They will be full of apparent conflicts. Um, what works well for structure doesn't work well for fire or vice versa. And it takes a lot of effort to get this stuff right. But it's often an area that the effort doesn't go into because, and perhaps even more so with these prefabricated systems, because um, those components are being developed in isolation. And often no one really ends up owning these interfaces between them. And they can be complicated. You know, you can, you have these trade-offs that you have to decide between like uh, fire performance and ceiling and, and tolerance. And then, I mean, tolerance is such a key one because it plays into so many things. If you're talking about uh, connections, for example, you're looking for stability and ductility and tolerance. They're, they seem on the surface like very conflicting requirements and you have to figure out how you're going to resolve that. Uh, and a lot of it comes down to this um, the difference between uh, these components that are made in a precision manufacturing environment and you bring them to real world site conditions which have very different requirements and, uh, and, and a very different environment. Um, so all this is not really the most glamorous part of uh, engineering buildings, but we definitely see this as the most critical for successful projects. So we put we put a lot of time into this. We we wanted to understand where does time and effort go on site. So we would do things like um, measure how long it takes to put in a, a set of screws into a connection. Uh, what's the effort? Actually measure the operator effort. At what point are they going to get fatigued? Um, we and we actually started to get quite scientific about this and develop these metrics for. Um, you know the the uh, the screw insertion times for different types of screws, and and we realised that you have to figure out what your critical path is. So uh, in the case of these uh, frame connections, we set up, uh, we simulated uh, different kind of conditions for the bay of a building. So we would impose different tolerances, um, assemble in different directions using different um, commercially available connectors, that sort of thing. Um, and actually measure and create some data on the performance that we could then use to make data-driven decisions. And you can start to build up a picture of where your, where your critical path is, where's your hook time going, um, and, and where potentially are the biggest gains for optimizing your system. Um, uh, for the connections in particular, we kind of had this tagline that it's about installation in seconds, not minutes. Um, and a, a key part of that is to have these kind of quick connect uh, and release type systems. We'll talk about the, the release a little bit more later on. Um, and about dealing with real world tolerances. So uh, for, for various types of connections, we could set up um, these kind of uh, simulated um, tolerance conditions representing worst cases and just see what the effect is of um, of different real world environments and it and it's quite interesting how robust or otherwise different systems can be to those sorts of things but again it's all about generating real data that you can use to compare and evaluate different systems um, we also realized there was um, a uh, a real incentive to remove the um, as much of the on-site propping as possible. So for these column connections, we developed uh, an integrated lifting system um, that could also uh, give sufficient initial stiffness that you didn't need to install temporary props, or at least you can disconnect the, the crane safely um, and continue using that for other operations. So here's an example of a crane being dropped into position, uh, of a column being dropped into position. And then the um, lifting hooks removed. And then the dropping of columns can continue on that floor. And a, and a key part of developing technology like that is that you want to be doing it offline. You don't want to be doing that on the critical path of a project. So we learn off-site, uh, and that's where we 
prove and improve these kind of systems. So what you see in the pictures here is an example of a prototype that we built in California. So this is a, it's, it's a building inside a building. Um, I've got a video of it here. Um, so this is kind of a, a, bit, a bit of a, a skunk works facility. To, to allow stuff to be prototyped um, offline and out of the, the public view. Uh, and it, but it really allowed us to, to try in a, as close to a real world environment as possible, how uh, real these games that we were predicting were gonna be. Um, and, and the whole sort of philosophy of this is that you, sure there's a cost involved in doing this offline prototyping, but you prototype it once and then on site you save it many times over um, and i think that's why this is uh it's particularly an approach that resonates with uh the kinds of developers who are doing multiple buildings on a large scale because um the time invested there is going to be repaid amply over the next uh, decade of doing similar similar buildings so some of those connectors that you saw there we uh We've now reached a stage where they are licensed for production with a, with a manufacturer in Europe. Uh, and the first pilot project for those is actually going to be uh, right here in Christchurch, which is pretty exciting. So this is the 211 High Building. That's going to be the new headquarters for um, Portus and Lee's Construction on the corner of High Street and Manchester Street. And uh, yeah, pretty exciting for us is that all the internal columns there are going to be using those um, Quick Connect, um, and it's been a it's been a big part of um, achieving the the most efficient overall building system that we could for this uh, for this particular development. Um, and it's going to be um, yeah, it's going to be quite a, a significant time for us when that starts going together later this year. So. In terms of this kind of focus on rapid and repeatable, where do, where do we think we could be looking next? Well, it's really interesting looking over at North America. Um, I'm sure you guys uh, would be familiar with the Brock Commons building uh, at University of British Columbia. I mean, that was completed uh, over five years, maybe six years ago now. and. And it's been kind of interesting that it's um, it stayed a bit of an orphan for a long time. It used this fairly, at the time, revolutionary uh, post and plate system without beams, but it achieved these astonishing kind of construction metrics. And um, we were a bit puzzled as to why it had never really been repeated since. And, and we actually went on a bit of a research uh, mission over to Canada to try and understand why. We talked to a lot of the people involved. Um, we've got to know the, the engineers from Fastenet, the, the test team from FP Innovations, and, and the, the local government who, who were involved in the approval of it. And they're really, like, we kept expecting to find the skeleton in the closet. But to be honest, uh, it just all seemed too good to be true. Um, the, the, there are some... Uh, complications of the post and plate system that I'll talk about in a minute, but uh, it just seemed like it was a matter of time for the approval landscape to kind of become resolved enough, particularly in North America, to enable it. And now the floodgates seem to be opening, to be honest. There's uh, a series of developments from a company called Oh Wow, um, predominantly around the Oakland area, and they too have just topped out on a similar post and plate building as Brock Commons. Uh, so it's 19 stories total, 16 stories of timber. So those 16 floors went up in less than three months. And the, the interesting thing is that the facade, uh, basically the, the, the whole building was following at the same speed as those timber floors. Like it, it, it genuinely has delivered on everything that they hoped in the program. Um, and the, the CEO of Oh Wow, Andy Ball, is actually coming over to talk in Australia next month at the uh, Timber Offsite Conference. And I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to hearing a bit more about what his experiences have been, because I think this is a real indicator of not necessarily just the post and plate system, but just when you get it right, how uh, impressive the potential for fast and cheap construction can be here. 
Um, focusing a little bit more on post and plate, it's an area that interests us as a group. Um, we've obviously seen examples that it can be fast and efficient. Uh, the flat ceilings with no beams mean you have reduced material costs, you've got freedom to route your services anywhere you want. Um, you minimize the floor to floor height. So that can either mean uh, within a given height, you get more stories or you have lower overall facade costs. If there's a downside of it to date, it's that your grid layout is dictated by how close you can space your columns. And that's in turn governed by your maximum transportable panel size. So depending on where you're sourcing your timber from, somewhere between three and 3.5 meters. So works for some types of buildings, not necessarily for all buildings. Um, Here's an example of a building that the, the Homes Group in the US have designed. Uh, it's called Sandy Pine, uh, and that's a, quite a premium residential apartment block in Portland. Uh, that's just been approved, uh, and that will be starting construction next year. Uh, so it's definitely, uh, it's an area that we see taking off in environments like New Zealand with similar seismic conditions. It'll be really interesting to see whether there is a, a transfer of this system uh, over here. And we'd certainly be keen to be a, a part of that process if there is. Um, uh, an area of interest for us at Home Solutions was the connection between the panel and the post. Uh, traditionally, that has had its challenges. Um, the failure mode in rolling shear is not necessarily the most predictable or uh, ductile. Um, and there are some challenges around fire protection. Uh, the way that any steel components are protected is and has not always been done in the most efficient way. So we set about um, seeing if it could be done a different way. So we looked at the, the layout of the Brock Commons building. We, um, we conceived of an alternative connection method where you don't have uh, this bearing uh, between the panel and the column. But we use basically the same setup with the same, um, effectively the same timber sizes. We actually narrowed up the columns enough that they could fit inside a, a demising wall. Uh, and when we tested it, we actually found that the, the concept that we had gave um, substantially higher performance than the, the original Brock Commons concepts and um, potentially a much easier fire solution because you don't have the same kind of protection requirements. Um, you don't have that rolling shear failure. You have a ductile failure in the internal components of the connector. Um, so that's just a little example of um, where we're looking at what might be coming and trying to get ahead of the game on the kind of technology that's, that could be required. Um, something else that we're looking at is longer span post and plate. So if you can start to connect these panels in a way that you have moment connections, um, that opens up um, opportunities. Here's uh, a building that we were uh, invited to go and see by um, another European connection manufacturer. Um, this is one of the few long span post and plate buildings or longer span, I should say. Um, it's currently being built in the Netherlands but it certainly indicates there's opportunities here and it's somewhere that we are quite actively looking at the minute. So um, watch this space on that one. Another building system that we see uh, has potential for rapid and repeatable is, is actually the simple light timber frame with CLT floors um, for the kind of maybe three to six story height range. We definitely see potential here um, with various different levels of prefabrication. Um, but it could certainly be done in a way that minimizes on-site work. There's technology out there that potentially uh, suits it, is, um, is potentially uh, compatible between New Zealand and US West Coast solutions with this off-shelf hardware. We, we definitely see an opportunity there for a kit of parts approach to these types of buildings. Um, and I think we definitely would be, uh, we would have be happy to see more of this type of building here in New Zealand. Um, 
so the characteristic of reusable, I think this is, uh, this is where the discussion is moving on really fast. We're no longer just talking about uh, sequestering carbon. The elephant in the room is what happens at end of life. Um, the reality is in 2023, almost all of the laminated timber goes into landfill. And, and there is some, there's some data around now that suggests landfill captures carbon rather than releasing it long term. Okay, that's, that's better than not, but it's still not really the big question. Like the point is, it's an opportunity cost of that timber to just bury it. Um, we have to start being responsible about our resources. Uh, if we are going to start reforesting with these vast monoculture plantations in order to create this timber, um, that's not without a cost. And the energy that it takes to, to harvest, to process and transport, we have to be responsible with the way we're spending that. So the mindset, I think, is all this, is more about guardianship of those resources. Uh, and, and what we see in Europe is the thinking is already well down that uh, track. So uh, in the Netherlands, the, these people call themselves urban miners or, or, or material harvesters. That's what the demolition the demolition companies are rebranding themselves as, as material harvesters. This is a company called New Horizons. Um, and the, 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 the approach is just that uh, everything, is, um, everything is a precious resource. Um, it's not, uh, it, it, you just need to enable the framework to be able to reuse it. So this, these pictures are from uh, Norway, a government initiative called Cirque which is establishing the uh, the grading and the marketplace and and how you uh, provide an efficient and effective way of reusing structural timber. Um, and it's got uh, I, I I was up in Norway for the World Timber Engineering uh, Conference um, uh, three or four weeks ago, and uh, I went to a um, uh, a press release, a uh, uh, discussion, pa a panel discussion on this stuff, which was supported by some of the local politicians. And it's pretty clear this stuff has really strong cross party support from uh, all the different parties there. They see it as a real key part of Norway's contribution to their um, climate reduction targets. So that's, that's really interesting. And it kind of gives a bit of a, um, an insight into what the pathway could be for us. The key thing is you need the legislation to enable reuse, you need the methods for inspecting and grading and storage, you need to create a marketplace so there's an incentive for this harvesting. That's kind of where Europe is at right now. Um, what needs to be happening right now is some kind of material passport so that it has known properties wherever it's used or reused. We have to design for disassembly and we have to create um, ways of reprocessing treated and coated timber because that's what we're deconstructing right now. Um, those are our priorities right now. We actually have a bit of time to figure out how we reuse glued laminated timber. That's, that's a big challenge and no one's saying uh, it's easy to figure out uh, what we do with that, but we're not gonna be disassembling those buildings for a long time. Um, we just have to make sure the methods are in there. So, uh, for example, on um, this is the one of the the connections that's going into the um, two eleven high building. Um, it's designed from the outset for disassembly. So this would be the way that you would remove uh, a column from a through beam assembly without any damage to any of the timber components. And I think already in Europe, we're at a, a state where in some countries, the legislation actually demands a, a plan for disassembly and reuse of the materials. And I can see a time where we'll be there here in New Zealand. And I think it might be coming faster than we expect. The key for me is we have to design for disassembly now. Um, anything we can do to avoid having to rebuild a building. So if you can just reconfigure a, 
the layout of a floor rather than a rebuild is, is absolutely worthwhile. But equally, reuse doesn't have to be same use. So it doesn't have to be that you build another office building. You could reuse that in some agricultural buildings or something that maybe have a slightly different set of requirements, uh, but the timber still has value. Uh, the, the key message really is you, you don't pass this problem on to the next generation. You design in the ability to reuse now. Um, so that uh, that prototype building that we built in the US, um, that actually got uh, taken down and moved to a different facility. So in three days, uh, this was the process to basically deconstruct it, flat pack it onto trucks, drive it from California to another state, and then um, rebuild it using all of the same components. I mean, I think we probably changed the the screws, that's probably about it. Every single other component that was used was, was reused to rebuild it again. Uh, resilience, um, we, so I think our attitude around lifetime of buildings probably needs a shake up. So on the left here, this is, these are the stave churches in Norway. That's the largest one in, in Telemark. That's 800 years old. Um, the building on the right, that's one of the temples uh, near Nara in Japan. That one's 1,200 years old. And it's just a bit of a reminder that a timber building doesn't have to be a disposable building that you demolish after 100 years. Like the, um, it can be done. And for sure, in their time, these were very important buildings. Uh, that had a significant um, social and uh, religious function. Um, so they had the time and the money spent on them to maintain them. But I mean, is that any different to the significant buildings uh, of our era now? Why shouldn't we be thinking in those same terms? Um, maybe we've got to lose that disposable building mindset. And part of that is making them survive significant events. So a typical meaning of resilience would be uh, this sort of thing, designing your frame connections so that they have um, zero damage. Um, and clearly we have uh, various technologies that are starting to address that. You know, the, the Tectonus dampers are an interesting development in that area as well. Um, quite compatible with the kinds of things that we're looking at. Um, but it's more than just, I think resilience is more than just uh, safety. We're talking about resilience of the building to events. Um, so the code ensures that we have safe buildings and it ensures life safety, but um, is what if you have, um, if, you're, if you're a mechanism for achieving drift compatibility is through damage, you still potentially have a lot of rebuild to do um, so this is a uh, this is some work at the University of Canterbury looking at if you have um, uh, a, a screwed connection after a, a high drift event how you could potentially um, rebuild that post earthquake or a repair that post earthquake it's it's a it's a worthy attempt to understand that but it's still a lot of effort to do it and and you've got to wonder in real terms whether that actually just means the building still gets uh, demolished so it's a, for us, it's more about continuity of service um, or preventing loss of accommodation. So for the types of systems we've been developing, we're, we're proving that for um, like a maximum considered earthquake, you can go through a, a, you know, a, an approved test cycle like a Curie cycle. Uh, and at the conclusion of that, you've still got components that are 100% undamaged and reusable. Um, the key is no structural repairs stay operational. Um, it's not the only kind of event, though. Uh, we, we see that probably one of the biggest threats to um, the long-term durability of timber buildings is actually leaks. And if you're talking to the insurance industry in the United States, this is actually their big fear. It's not fire. Um, it's that we are we haven't designed the buildings to be internally robust to water and uh, 
I think there's a lot more that we can all do to understand that. We talk about moisture in a construction environment, and that's true, and that's a big part of what we need to solve. But there's also being robust to things that can happen internally and designing the, the services to be robust themselves too. Um, but it's all about preventing high consequence by smart engineering. Robustness, I think, uh, again, a few different interpretations of that. Like the typical meaning is about preventing progressive collapse. And what we see in Europe is the thinking on this is probably a bit further advanced than in most other regions. So any, it's not just, <clears throat> it's not just the super high risk buildings like um, government buildings and hospitals and pretty much any residential apartments over about five stories have to have demonstrated robustness to progressive collapse and there's a there's a few different methods to do that um, but one of them is just by providing huge tie forces uh, across connections uh, so um, that's any any of the stuff we've been involved in designing. That's what we've targeted is providing these um, these tie forces. These are not very exciting videos because thankfully they they fail in a, a predictable ductile manner. Um, but that's definitely that. There, there's clearly different ways of demonstrating um, robustness. You know, you can do simulations and key element removal and so on. But this is definitely uh, one part of the puzzle is providing those tie forces. Um, but under robustness, I probably I probably include um, design for fire under that as well, largely because there's so many uh, unknowns still around that. Like the code is far from being a complete picture of how a building would respond. Um, so we we definitely get involved in a lot of this. We've got our own furnace. We do a bit of work at other furnaces as well, uh, just trying to understand what the what the reality of reaction in a fire situation would be. And they're looking at some of these areas that are real gray areas in the code, when you're mixing steel and timber, um, what really happens? If you look at it from a performance basis rather than just like a code basis, what do you actually get? It's really like bringing it back to this sort of robustness heading. It's just about proving you don't have a disproportionate response to any event that happens. And I think the, um, the driver for that really is the big picture is we can't afford a disaster in mass. Well, I mean, we can't afford a disaster anyway from a human perspective, but particularly as we're trying to get mass timber accepted as this conventional building system, we can't afford a Grenfell Towers or a, or a CTV building. So we have like robustness has to be key on our, um, on our list of priorities. So kind of coming back to the where I, I started all this, um, where where do we want mass timber to be in 10 years time? I mean, uh, 10 years is a long time if we're talking climate change and affordable housing. Like we want to be making a meaningful difference by then, which means we've got a long way to go from where we are. Uh, and these technologies are going to have to evolve really quick. Um, it basically means we've got to lose that one-off mindset when we're designing buildings. We need to start thinking about technology which you can then reuse on thousands of simple and repeatable buildings. Um, and I think then, you know, if you fast forward a thousand years, which is kind of where these buildings are now, uh, are we going to look back and are we going to be happy that we made the most responsible use that we could have? Um, of our resources. So that's my story. Um, I know that was a lot of slides in a short time. So um, apologies for bombarding you with that, but I'm more than happy to uh, kind of rewind and, and talk about any of those. Thank you, John. Um, yes, it might have been a lot of information, but it's, it's really good information. I think it's one of the the best snapshots I have seen in terms of what, what's happening uh, around the world in New Zealand. And I think I have kind of written down a few keywords which really stuck in my head. And I would probably in reverse, like, uh, I agree, we should try really hard not to have any disaster because the last thing we want is any of our team of buildings in New Zealand or around the world being in the news of, of you know, in, in the negative news saying, you know, it, it, 
it burned down or it rot it, it rotted and and yeah it's actually something no one wants the other thing quite clearly you mentioned reusable we need to be mm. able to reuse our timber and you also mentioned low damage and i found that the two come together quite nicely quite often the low damage systems are reusable and they're mountable you've shown tectonos you quick connect uh, press lamps or post tension structures they can all be disassembled quite easily and reused around the country so that's uh, i think yeah. some, that farms in new zealand is perhaps already leading the way a little bit on a smaller yeah. scale being a smaller country but we're doing it and robustness um there's ongoing conversation about robustness of structures, especially timber, and I think that's something we need to address as well. Our new standard looks at robustness from a different angle, avoiding brittle failure modes, but definitely something to, to look at a bit more in detail. And lastly, you obviously mentioned moisture and fire. Both are hot topics at the moment, and in fact, there's a few questions coming in on, on that. But before yeah. we go into the questions, because they're slowly rolling in, your opinion, you've been uh, now working on this for a few years in New Zealand and, and you have seen what happens around the world. What is the single most or single biggest hurdle, in your opinion, we have in New Zealand to get more of these mass timber structures across the board? What's your view on that? Right now, I think it's probably the, um, the approval process around... Uh, things like fire and the some of the uh uncertainty around that and and the way that um in order to use a performance based approach to to take advantage of um things that maybe lie outside the code uh, oftentimes the testing that accompanies that ends up uh belonging to uh, the developer say it's not available in the public domain, which means there's a lot of repeated effort going into doing things better, I guess, is what I'm saying. Um, and, and maybe it's not just a, that's certainly not just a fire related thing. We see that in, in many aspects of the building. But I think there's an opportunity for us to combine our knowledge and share it to be able to do things more in a more innovative way. Yeah. And look, I couldn't agree more. I, I see the same. Fire is probably the more dominant one because it's more recent at the moment, but I see this repetition as well. Um, and I agree the fire is a big hurdle. And luckily, there is a working group at the moment led by Timber Unlimited uh, looking at uh, how to address this shortcoming and to make sure there's a common understanding between fire engineers, structure engineers, architects, and then the BCAs and, and FANS, uh, fire emergency in New Zealand. So there's something um, on its way, and hopefully this will relax this problem uh, a little bit. So yeah. staying on the fire uh, com, uh, topic, there are a few questions about fire. Uh, one is, do you know how internationally they protect uh, this are this multi thirty mobilings from from um, from the fire? Is it charring or is it encapsulation or the means? So, and... sure. So carry on. Well, no, please go ahead. Um, yeah, we've seen both, and um, it really varies by what the um, the market is for the end use of the building. So some of those uh, Post and plate buildings, for example, that are being built in North America are actually fully encapsulated. Um, I think what we've seen with encapsulation is it's, it gets expensive when it's complicated. So when you're trying to encapsulate around complicated features and um, you've got multiple layers and that sort of thing, that's when it gets expensive. Um, there is I mean, I think everybody who's got a timber building would love to expose the timber if they can. And there's definitely a drive in the US to being able to do more of that. And the the code is actually just being updated there to allow um, a higher percentage of exposed timber in, in high rise buildings. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a mix. I mean, I think there's always uh, nothing comes for free. Either you're paying for more timber for a char layer in in some way. Uh, or you're paying for encapsulation, but uh, like safety has a cost and, and it, um, it has to be accounted for. Um, another question related to fire, uh, obviously the connections are not a critical point. Is there any 
research from your side, from Holmes' side, addressing that? Because at the moment, the only the only way is to fully encapsulate by timber order means your your steel mm -hmm. connection. Is there any, or do you have any idea or any recommendation uh, on that topic? Uh, so, uh, sorry, just to to recap that, is there any alternative to encapsulation or um, char layer protection? Correct, because uh, currently the, the New Zealand Australian standard is, is quite limited. Yeah, sure, sure. You, I guess we're talking about the updates with the temperature limits for steel components right. and yeah. so on. Yeah, I think there are, because I think, um, I mean, w one observation that we would make is that those, uh, there's always a performance-based uh, approach available. And if there are situations where high steel temperatures don't have high consequence, if you can prove that by testing, that, uh, that avenue is always available. And I think that's something we should be looking at because not all connections are equal. Some are very highly loaded, some are not. And I think there are things we can explore there. Um, are things like, um, intumescent coatings, if they, uh, they may not be 100% of the answer, but can they be part of a system engineered answer, for example? So yes, I do think there are alternatives. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think we have to, uh, it, those are gonna need uh, development and physical testing to understand them. Yeah, yeah, and I think more testing on those is definitely mm -hmm. required moving forward. Hopefully yeah. not by a single supplier, but by, yeah an open source type entity. Exactly, um, yeah. uh, last question on fire for now. Um, uh, it's a combination between the, the fact of reusing timber and fire. So the question is, if designing for this assembly, would fire considerations be the main hurdle? For example, sealants, detailing for penetrations. Have you put any thought on that? Yeah, we have. So definitely using um, dry solutions would be preferable. Uh, so we've looked at using uh, things like uh, tapes and strips that are pre-applied rather than using like post-applied sealants. Um, so I don't think it has to be uh, a challenge for disassembly. Um, I think those, those are solvable issues. <laughs> okay, I, I, I don't agree with really. you. Now let's look at some other aspects. There was a quite specific question if uh, you slash Holmes are doing any testing on fungal or insect or any other sort of decay. This is, it seems to be related to bridge, timber bridges in New Zealand. And um, mm. maybe you can. Uh, yeah, uh, so we haven't undertaken any of that in-house ourselves. We definitely, we know that some testing like that has been undertaken at Scion. Um, and they're probably the kind of the leading authority on that kind of thing in New Zealand at the minute. But it's definitely an interesting subject. And the whole kind of treated versus or treatment levels versus timber species and so on is definitely uh, it's a subject we need to get uh, a better consensus on here for sure. Yes. Uh, uh... I, I would like to add that Walker Kotahi New Zealand Transport Authority is looking at obviously building more timber bridges with a 100 year durability target. And therefore, there's work underway on that. And there, there are some reports, mainly from Sound, are talking about uh, specifically timber on, on that. And another question was you showed this quite long uh, timber floor spans, uh, mm. the being, being spliced and so on. Do you know of any uh, acoustic testing or vibration testing on these systems or on these uh, mass timber structures in general? Yes. Um, in fact, we're doing some right now, but I can't really talk about it. <laughs> um, but we're not, we're far from the only people. Uh, there is definitely, there's a lot of activity in this area right now. And I think um, if, we're, if we're talking specifically about that uh, long span post and plate system, um, it has so many potential uh, advantages that a lot of people are, are pushing hard to understand exactly those aspects because the, the acoustic and vibration is clearly going to be a challenge for a, for a, a large two-way span. Um, but if it can be made to work in an economical solution, um, I see a big future for it. Yeah. Um, thank you, John. That one. So there's a few other questions. I'm going to pick a few because you're already a bit over time. Um, there's sure. two questions which are kind of related, or I, I want to relate them to each other. One question is: Do you see that? To think, sorry, that 
current CLT supply is sufficient for the demand in the next years. And at the same time, you do mention in your testing, testing GL24 timber. Um, obviously, that's a European timber, I assume. So yep. was that important for a specific reason? Or what, what's your feel on, on the source? Or the, sure. The um, is the current CLT supply enough? I mean, I, I guess the best answer I could give is I hope not, because I hope the demand gets so big. <laughs> Our, seal, our supply is always struggling to keep up with it. Um, but uh, clearly there, there are some struggles at the minute um, about whether we have sufficient domestic supply, uh, but I can see that's changing. Um, there's more facilities coming online. Um, European timber, there are projects using that here. Um, the reason we used it in testing is uh, we've got a lot of it. <laughs> Basically, the, the systems we were developing with Lendlease, we'd actually imported a lot of the European timber that they, they use all around the world, but they'd actually used it in their buildings in Australia. Um, so we just happened to be uh, using that for our testing. It's not fundamentally different in terms of design compared to New Zealand timber. The, the mechanical properties are a little bit different, but not fundamentally. Um, the biggest difference, as most people know, is whether it's treated or not. Um, and uh, th th there's a lot of discussion about that. But um, yeah, we probably won't get into here. <laughs> um, thank you. Well, there's a question which goes the same way, and I, I would like to ask you that one then. Um, yeah. Because it, it's it's a bit more generic than just about mm. treatment. But the question is, do you think New Zealand should consider growing alternative timber species? Because we have vast plantations of Yada, Yada pine, which uh, grow quickly, have medium physical properties. So there's obviously better timber material available or species available. But from a treatment perspective uh, as well, what's your take? Should we look at microcarpa, cypress type uh, species to be grown in New Zealand or even gum, eucalypt, for instance? It's a, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I'm, I'm certainly no forestry expert, so um, I, don't un, I don't understand well enough whether the, the yield and the, the economics of growing the other species would stack up. Um, I think it's worth challenging. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think we sometimes we end up in these situations by default without really asking the hard questions. Um, and yeah, I, I would love to see some more informed discussion on that subject. Yeah. Um, and I, I can I can tell that um, there's organization in New Zealand looking at alternative species, but it is a very long process, not because the decision making takes that long. It's part of it. Growing a new species takes <laughs> years. And yeah. so I think uh, to be continued, and I think work is definitely uh, going on in the background. Um, so last few questions. Um, one is about, uh, do you have any initial thoughts about the reuse of laminated timber moving forward? I mean, you mentioned something uh, probably in 40 years time, but you also said yeah. we should start looking at it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the key is we have to find a way, or we have to design in ways of taking them apart now. And then that buys us the time to figure this out. I mean, I've seen some interesting research on reusing laminated timber in um, uh, particle board, uh, where shredding the glue into the mix can actually be beneficial to the resulting properties of the of the board. Um, which sounds doable. The only thing is you have to have very good control of what's going into it. So that's where this concept of the material passport comes in. You have to understand exactly what uh, chemicals and components you are now putting into your new product. Um, but I think there's going to be options. Uh, I mean, the first option is just to reuse it. Uh, if you have to maybe lose 10% of the length of a structural member uh, and reuse it in a different situation, well, you know, maybe that's okay. Maybe that's mm -hmm. still the best outcome you could get for that piece of timber. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank, thanks for your thoughts on that too. Yeah. Um, now let's let's pick this one to finish off. Um, again, it's a bit of a generic one and, and could mm -hmm. be a part of a future discussion. And the question here is, how can we incentivize more mass timber structures in New Zealand? So it's a quite open one. Mm. Is it more, should we more incentivize the, the big uh, developers to build more of these big developments or should we more incentivize the small 
projects um, to go to have them a bit more in timber. I mean, I think uh, looking at how it's happening in Europe, we just have to get the carbon legislation in place as soon as possible. Like if that's what we've collectively agreed as a society is our priority, let's just enact it and make it a condition and there will be pushback and it will be a hard fight from in the, from the construction industry. But um, that's the catalyst for change, in my opinion. Um, it has to be the, driven from the legislation. Yeah. Uh, look, I couldn't agree more. I think it's a really good concluding remark uh, to, to finish off this, uh, this uh, presentation today. Uh, before I let you go, uh, there were a number of more comments than questions, which were uh, Unisono saying, really great presentation, John. I'd really covered everything we're doing at the moment uh, in New Zealand and worldwide. So definitely a really good snapshot, good presentation and a good summary. So thank you very much uh, from behalf of all the attendees and obviously from myself and Timber Design Society. Thank you very much. And, and thanks for the contribution in general, because we need more people like you and, and your company, Holmes, who are working, working on, on bringing mass timber to the people. So thank you very much. And have a good afternoon, everyone. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers. Bye -bye. See you.